probably never had so many people at an exhibition opening. We never received so much attention from the media and we never had members of the world's most famous orchestra generously agreeing to perform here. The story of the artist David Friedman can be told in many ways. It is the story of a well-known painter and press illustrator in the golden era of the 20s and 30s in Berlin. The story of a man persecuted by the Nazis, his artwork looted, stolen or lost. It's the story of an immigrant to the United States. The story of an advertisement designer and artist who lived in St. Louis with his second wife and their daughter. The story of an artist later relatively unknown and forgotten until he died in 1980. But the story of this exhibition is also the story of David Friedman's daughter Miriam Friedman Morris and her quest for the legacy of her father. I'm very happy and honored that Miriam is here tonight to celebrate with us this extraordinary moment. The story of this exhibition cannot be told without mentioning the Berliner Philharmonica. In the preparation for this project, it has proven to be the most generous one. For this exhibition, the Berlin Philharmonic keeps the memory of David Friedman and his dramatic story alive and honors his artistic contributions to the Philharmonic's past. So when looking at David Friedman's drawings today, one understands that in the 1920s, the orchestra was already what we today call a multicultural community. At this point, I would like to extend a very warm thank you to Miriam Friedman Morris, David Friedman's daughter. Without her tenacity, in recovering copies of the old printings, we would all not be here tonight. The original exhibition in the Philharmonie came about largely by chance. Friedman wasn't only an acclaimed painter, but also worked as a press artist in the 1920s. A large number of David Friedman's portraits were of musicians, and many of those were musicians connected with the Berlin Philharmonic. His drawings were never caricatures, but always intended to be objective and illuminating. Unfortunately, most of Friedman's original drawings have not survived. It was a happy coincidence, as well as a stroke of luck, that during preparations for the Berlin exhibition in autumn 2008, Miriam was able to acquire an original drawing of the Czech violinist Vaja Shihoda in the UK. This original, which may have come from the violinist's estate, is now being exhibited for the second time as an American premiere. Thank you very much for your interest in my father, David Friedman. He was an accomplished artist, a painter renowned for his portraits drawn from life. He was also, as you learned, a survivor of Auschwitz. His family was murdered. He was deprived of his profession and everything he owned. Since childhood, I watched him paint with an intensity and passion that struck a chord in me. I was intrigued about his successful pre-war career and the unknown fate of his art looted by the Gestapo in Berlin. He had little to show me from a collection that numbered over 2,000 artworks. This fueled my passion to find these lost works and rescue his reputation from oblivion. I am delighted that we have been able to bring you this exhibition which befits the Berlin Philharmonic's short residency in New York and that two members of the orchestra are adding the musical dimension to this occasion. Never would my father or my mother have believed that this could be possible, that German institutes would support and honor his work and that members of the world famous Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra would play in tribute. Giving music a face is more than just an exhibition of drawings of musicians by an artist who was banned and nearly exterminated. It also gives a face to its creator, David Friedman. Thank you very much.
to my left is Detlef Lawrence. He's also he also came uh, all the way from Berlin. Uh, he is an art historian. He is um, an author. In 2008, he published a booklet um, with an essay on David Friedman as a press artist, and he's a specialist on the field of the of artists. He calls it the lost generation artists that have been forgotten because of the Nazis. What could you tell us about the background or the context in which uh, David Friedman um, developed his art? The press was the only and main information medium for all the people. And all these papers uh, needed press artists. They are fast, they could situations, and portraits and sports activities and all these things in a very fast and in a better way than the photo. My father wrote a diary on his way from um, his liberation all the way to uh, Prague. He listed the newspapers that he that published his works and he also gave us the hint of this photo verlag, this um, little agency that, this, that he uh, submitted his works to and then they were sent to more than 240 German language newspapers not only in Germany but outside of Germany. In the early 1990s I said I want to go to Europe, I want to go to Berlin, I want to see for myself and so then I found out indeed there were a number of newspapers left and I realized that um, there were more, that this was a treasure and that I would have to really spend dedicated time sitting in the archive from nine to five going through every page and by that time Detlef was with me and I had help and um, he's still doing it. He's still searching for more portraits. <laughs> this he did after the war. This is a series of one of eight that were bought by the Jewish Agency for Palestine that was bringing these works to Palestine to show them in an exhibition. And they are, except for that one, are in the collection of Yad Vashem today. This is 1963 about. And my father put himself in his work as a prisoner with the glasses. This is a deportation scene to the lodge ghetto and the Gestapo man is asking him, where is all your uh, money and jewelry? He was on the last train from the lodge ghetto to Auschwitz and um, he was lucky to be chosen for life because he was already not a young man. Some fellow prisoners that he knew already from Prague and Berlin and they told him he was not going to survive there because it was a hard labor camp. So he says, you better show them that you can paint. So here he, um, so he made his own brushes and he got pails from the kitchen. He went all around the camp picking up little pieces of supplies and he went back to the barrack and he stood on a table and he painted for his life. Even though he hated, <laughs> hated them very much, this was also his, his uh, that he was able to paint gave him solace. This was what he, he lived for and he loved to paint. And he was also did landscapes. So. This is how he survived in Glywitz one, and then he survived the death march with the help of uh, younger prisoners who helped him alternatively through the death march to Blechhammer, where he uh, was liberated in January 1945 by the Russians. Why was it important for the Berliner to be involved in this project? The Berlin Philharmonic started, and it's very essential that the impulse came from the musicians themselves to look into the a new history of the orchestra, especially into the years 32 to 45. What started your quest for your father's legacy? You said when you were growing up, uh, your father actually talked very little about the times in Berlin. That's true. What I saw from my father, he was very intensely painting the scenes from the Holocaust and his memories of the Holocaust. And this was really, he felt his most important work. It wasn't until like the early 70s, one day a package arrived at our house, he was very excited. They had found a portfolio of his famous uh, chess portrait. Here it was called Das Schachmeister Turnier. It was the World Chess Tournament, 1923. So you have to understand he had lost everything. So he came out of Auschwitz with nothing. Therefore he had very little to show me. So now he was very proud to show me. You see, Mary, I have these portraits here from the chess um, tournament and you can see that I was a very famous artist at the time. I think most of his uh, portraits of the musicians in this shorthand they show a special aspect of 
the art of these artists. So they give a very special insight. One of my famous pictures is this one of the clarinet player Karl Esberger. And in a way, it looks a bit like a caricature. The man is very much concentrated on his instrument. On the other hand, George Sell, the young George Sell, who later went to the US, just showing the way he was rehearsing and conducting. Also here, Frenkel, which is, uh, or Wolfsthal, the violin, which was his love. So you see the, the way they are very intimate with their instrument, the way they communicate with their instrument. And this original, which Miriam found, the Vaja Pshihoda, shows a, a strong and very elegant man. That is, I think that's unique, and that was for us unique, because most of the records of the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra were destroyed during the war. The Philharmonie was bombed at the end of January 44, so we lost many things. And some of these musicians, there are no, no photographs. So through Friedman, and as you put the wonderful title, giving music a face, it's also giving the musicians a face. How did you end up in St. Louis? We were living in um, Israel, but it was a very poor economic situation there. It was a very long process to come to the United States. He had a difficult time because now he was already uh, nearing 60, and his uh, one distant relative didn't want to um, be responsible for the family. And my father, it, he wrote this, because again, I learned this from his letters. He, it took him 100 letters to convince not his cousin, but the husband of the cousin, that he would not be a burden to them. In this case, it took about two years to get the, the permits to come to the United States. But he also had seen an ad for the signs of the, in this magazine called, it was a professional journal called Signs of the Time. And he sent his um, uh, a resume and some artwork to this uh, company called General Outdoor Advertising. It was at that time in, uh, headquartered in Chicago, Illinois. And the director receives it, and he turns to his colleague, Willi Wint. And he says, Willi, do you know this artist from Berlin? And he says, yes. He used to sneak into the department so he could watch Friedman paint. So thus, my father was given a go-ahead to come to the United States. He sold some paintings and came to the United States. We came on our own. And he was ta literally taken off the ship and brought to the studio of general outdoor advertising. And it's a very interesting story because it correlates to what happened to him in Auschwitz. He was asked to draw, to choose, well, it was not quite as bad. <laughs> he wasn't, <laughs> but, but, but the situation was he had to paint for his life because he was now 61 yes. years of age. Yeah, nice. and, and he was told, okay, choose something and paint for us. And he had never painted a billboard in his life. It was 22 feet high. And he um, chose a portrait. And he started to do the charcoal outline, and people were already gathering because they saw something that caught their attention, that he knew what he was doing. And by the third day, he had the whole, the whole entire company was standing behind him, including the president from Chicago flew in, and he was hired on the spot, and he said they never had an artist like him. But once he retired, it was 1962, he went right back to what was deepest in his heart, what had been waiting for him all those years. He returned to the paintings from the concentration camp, and he created another series in St. Louis. Thank you so much, Miriam. I'd just like to introduce my daughter, the granddaughter of David Friedman, and my daughter, Lauren. Thank you also, Detlef Lawrence, art historian from Berlin. Many thanks, Helge Grunald from the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. Many thanks to you for coming tonight. Have a look at the exhibition, like maybe again, after having heard all this story, we're having the exhibition until the end of March. And listen to the music. Thank you very much.